Okay, so today we're going to budgeting and we're going to look um, at the major aspects of budgeting we'll be discussing will be with respect to with respect to the um, so we'll look at definition Um, then types, techniques, and then in the final part of, okay, so uses, definition and uses, so we can put the uses here, and then we'll do the quantitative aspects. All right, so what is a budget? We said a budget is a quanti quantified plan of action for a forthcoming period. So uh, the a plan of action for the next period is a budget, essentially. And we said quantified. Um, whenever I ask for definition of budget, one of the things I always get is a our income or expense, all those kinds of things. Now, while a budget will usually have financial figures at, attached to it, a budget mustn't necessarily have financial figures. So it's a quantitative plan. That's all it is. So um, the plan would include numbers. So if we have, for example, we want to budget the number of bags of um, cement that will be used to build a house, for example, then we can have just the numbers and maybe, um, so we'll have maybe amount. Now, if we have amount in say dollars, then if we did not have, what I want to say is, if for example, we wanted to break this down into, um, maybe we're building an estate, for example, I wanted to break down into maybe we had um, three rooms, a four room, and a five room, um, different kinds of houses. And then we have the quantity of um, cement that will be used, for example. Then this will qualify as a budget because we have the quantity that we are going to use even without the financial figures. Is this clear? Usually with the budget, there will be financial figures, but it doesn't, it, a, 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 a quantified plan without financial figures will still um, fall or will still be defined as a budget. And that's something that's important for us to know. Now, in our uses of budget, we'll generally look at six uses of a budget. Well, is that six now or seven? So I use one of my least favorite of this is this PCC EME is what we use as our, our mnemonic for the uses of a budget. So um, a budget is particularly useful for planning purposes. It's useful for control. So let's enumerate them. It's useful for control. It's useful for communication. It's useful to coordinate the activities of all the various um, aspects of whatever um, activity is being executed. It's useful for evaluation. Then useful for monitoring.
when is that monitoring or motivation? Sorry, monitoring is monitoring is coordination. So that's motivation. Monitoring is is um, coordination now. So motivation. And um, finally, what? So for authorization. Um, planning and control are two of the major aspects of um, the uses of a budget. And they would intertwine with each other. Now, when we look at planning, um, for an organization, we generally look at different um, levels of planning. So the at strategic, tactical, and operational levels of um, management, which would have to do with the way that planning operates. So with a budget, the, if the budget is prepared, now look at the different types, um, whether it's a top-down approach or different approaches to budgeting. So in a top-down approach, strategic apex will be involved with the preparing the budget. And then this information will now be transmitted downwards to the tactical and to the operational. So strategic is the upper management, the topmost um, level of management. Tactical is the middle management and operational is the day-to-day -day management, the lower levels of management. Please remember when we talk about strategic, tactical, and operational, we're talking about management. It's just different aspects of management. So for an organization, we generally look at the board of directors, that level as strategic, while um, senior management will be looked at as tactical. So uh, maybe executive directors that are not on the board, those kind of um, individuals. And then at this um, operational level, we're looking at managers. So lower management, junior management, these, uh, these different levels. Now, what a budget will help to do is to be able to plan. So the long-term objectives of the organization that are and determined by the strategic, strategic management will now be cascaded downwards. So the tactical managers will be those that are in charge of the budgeting process in many cases. And then they will be required to um, use the plans of the strategic apex and then incorporate those plans into the budget so that this can be passed on to the operational managers that are involved in the day-to-day -day activities of the organization. So these are um, this understanding is what would usually be tested in the objective question when they are asking this, um, of uses of budget, particularly with respect to planning. Now for control, um, what the budget helps to do is to enable a, um, to minimize excesses in the activities of the organization. So maybe wastages or other aspects of excesses that might be. So what, what the budget will try, will do is to, since we have the figures, we'll be working towards those figures. So it helps to keep the organization in check, keep the organization's activities in check, allows the organization to be able to carry out its activities within a framework. So that's what the budget does. Now, in terms of communication, we've discussed communication when we're talking about planning. So it basically helps the senior managers to be able to communicate with lower levels, including the employees. That's what the budget will do. When the budget is prepared, it will help um, that communication to be effected. Now, in terms of coordination, the activities of the various um, entities within the organization, the activities of staff can be well. Now, um, when we look at, for example, the master budget, all what will happen in the preparation of a budget in many cases will be that different departments, divisions, different units within the organization will submit their budgets. Now, if they're submitting their budgets, then it means that by the time the final budget is created, that budget will help to coordinate all the aspects of the different. So, so what we're trying to do here is to ensure that maybe the sales department, if the sales department budgets or says that we're going to be able to sell 500, but the production department is saying, we will produce 800, then this gives a problem because you're producing more than you can sell and that becomes an issue. So what coordination does is that it helps the different budget lines, the different um, units within the organization to be able to understand what's our overall objective, what do we want to achieve? And so in this case now, if the sales department could sell a maximum of 500 and there's no way to increase capacity, then the production department will have to scale down production to 500. On the other hand, if the sales department could sell 800 
and the production department was only producing 500, then the decision will be made as to whether to increase capacity of the production department to meet that 800 or to reduce the capacity or to find some kind of um, balancing of this, um, of the activities of the different organizations. So even with marketing, even with finance, all the different functions are coordinated um, using a budget. Now, in terms of evaluation, at the end of a period, then the performance will be able to review. Um, it will, if they say, if you don't know where you're going to, how do they say that thing? If you don't know where you're coming from, you won't know where you're going to. That's not exactly what I wanted to say, but more like, if you don't have a plan, then even if you got to your destination, you won't have, we won't know where you have gotten to. And that's what evaluation does with a budget. You prepare the budget at the beginning of the period, and then you have a plan. So when we get to the end of the period, it will now, um, if you're, if you're now one of the things we're going to do as we go through now is the discussion of um, performance measurement. The only way I'll be able to measure performance is if there was a target set. And um, one of the good things about, for example, this paper, your target is 50. So if you get above 50, then you've passed if you don't. But if there was no target and you just say, we're going to mark your script, then it doesn't make any sense. So what the budget does for you is that it gives, since it is prepared at the beginning of the period, everybody already knows what our budget is. And then we're able to manage our activities to ensure that our activities are within the budget. And at the end of the day, when um, we're evaluating performance, when performance is being decided as whether it's good or bad, the, base, the budget will serve as the basis for deciding whether one has achieved what they were supposed to achieve or has not. So that's what evaluation does. And then in terms of motivation, we'll look at, and when we discuss budgeting and um, we'll, we'll discuss the relationships between budgets and standards and how um, the standard will basically, if the standard is set in a way that it is challenging enough, but not impossible to achieve, then it will give motivation to the budget holders, to the different um, entities within the budget to be able to, or within the organization to work hard. So the budget creates a basis, or if, if the budget is properly, and this is, this is because we understand that budgeting, one of the things we should mention earlier, or um, at the beginning of our discussion is the fact that a budgeting, budgeting is a human activity. And so there is the potential for those human um, tendencies to be incorporated into a budget. But we're saying if ideally a budget is prepared in a way that it is challenging, but not excessive, then it will create motivation for people to work out because I want to meet the budget. Now we'll also talk about the different approaches to budgeting and how this can have an impact on motivation. And then finally, authorization, a budget gives the ability for um, management to be able to decide or for the organization to be able to decide how resources will be spent and who resources will be allocated to. So in terms of authorization, um, if it is not in the budget, then um, you know that it is not in the budget. So if there needs to be supplementary or if there needs to be some kind of adjustment for that um, activity to be embedded, then that's fine. But generally what the budget helps to do is to streamline so that we do not start doing other things that um, resources are channeled to their most important use at the beginning of the period. So all the um, different aspects of the organization are able to see what exactly they are supposed to be engaged in. And as a result of that, resources are only allocated to those activities that have been defined. And so it helps that that helps for authorization. So the confusion about should I give or should I not give on how much should I give, what when should I give it, all of these can be defined in a budget and then it reduces the potential for um, distractions, if you will. So these are the uses, the primary uses of the budget. Is there any question? Okay, nobody said anything. But good. All right, so basically what we've just discussed, I'd like to go through this thing. I've not been doing that. So um, a quantified plan of action for the forthcoming period. Now budgets usually have financial figures attached, but must not necessarily be reflected in financial terms. So before we go far, I've seen one. So our objectives of a budget for planning that the budget can serve as a primary tool to enable all levels of management in an organization plan how resources 
would be expanded over the next period. So remember that the budget is for the next period. We we'll usually say the next period is the next year, but we will see that budgets can be prepared monthly, budgets can be prepared um, quarterly, budgets maybe can be prepared biannually or even weekly. You see um, those kind of issue, um, um, ways that budgets can be prepared. Now, um, in terms of control, the budget helps to ensure that activities are carried out within the defined boundaries, like we said, and expectations of management. In essence, the budget helps to ensure that there is proper utilization of resources and our excesses are curtailed, okay? So coordination has to do with the budget process serving as a tool for senior management to ensure that all functions within the organization are in line with the overall objectives defined by senior management. And then in terms of communication, it serves as a means of communication across different functions and between senior management and junior managers to enable strategy to be effectively communicated to lower um, aspects of the organization. And then evaluation enables performance to be evaluated and enables again, the depiction of what will be accepted as success. So that's in terms of performance measurement now in the activities performed by the various functions and then motivation, defining what is expected to be achieved in the budget at the beginning of the period enables staff to appreciate what level of performance is expected, a well-prepared planned budget, which incorporates some level of demand to achieve can serve as motivation towards, I don't know what, to staff, okay to strive to attain. And then authorization has to do with it being the primary document for approval and disbursements. Okay, all right, so that's our gist. Now we go on to budgeting approaches. There are um, three main budgeting approaches, um, two of which we primarily focus on. Um, Top-down approach is also described as um, imposed approach while the bottom-up approach is, um, so in the top-down approach, senior managers will determine the budget and that budget will now be um, driven down the organization basically by tactical managers. So in a top-down approach, senior management makes and plans um, the budget. So they, we say they make the plans that are to be articulated in the budget and this is used as the basis for creating the budget, which is handed down to lower managers for implementation. Um, the budget has little or no input by the functional managers. Now that's the top-down approach. So top-down is imposed. Now in the bottom up, on the other hand, in the bottom up, the junior managers, so the different functional managers will prepare their budgets and these budgets would be collated ultimately for use by the organization. So what will happen is that um, junior or operational managers will create their budgets and these budgets will ultimately be taken up basically as, as uh, computed, collated, and then this will form the budget that will be used by the organization. Now I want to ask a question, in the top-down approach and the bottom-up approach, which one is a better approach to budgeting? What do you mean my budget? What do you mean uh, better? <laughs> That's a way not to fall into the trap. Better, which one no, is better? Yes, which is better? Is it as easier to make? Is it that it gets everybody which one, involved? Which one, uh, which, one be, which one will an organization, which one will benefit an organization more? Bottom-up. Oh, okay. That's my own. That's my own. Bottom that's, up. That's your own. Uh, that's that's my own opinion. What I want. What you wanted to say. Right. Um, so opinion, um, it would, it would generally feel like if the bottom up approach is a more, um, because it is participatory. First of all, it will have the um, possibility of ensuring that the those that have created the budget take ownership for the, that budget. Because if the junior managers are the ones that have, um giving figures that will be used as their budget, then they can't turn back and complain about the fact that the budget is not 
um, you now created a budget that we don't understand. It's not us that, but in, in the bottom-up approach, they have been involved with that budget being created. So they have they will take responsibility for whatever is within the budget. So that's that's the issue. Now I like the, what you said earlier on, which was what what what's the basis for defining which one is better. Now in a case now, for example, where there's um, an emergency of some sort and a budget needs to be created. In a case where um, there are significant changes in the business environment, what we will see is that a top-down approach will generally be a faster way to create a budget than the bottom-up where um, the individual managers will be creating their budget. So there might be issues, there might be cases, and this is deciding which one is a better budget. What I want to say is deciding which budget is better will be dependent on the circumstances. It won't, it is for us to say bottom-up, yes, generally, because of that whole participation and the fact that um, junior managers will now take ownership, we will generally say that yes, we will generally prefer this. But circumstances in the operating environment will determine which of these budgets is better. You will generally see that for newer organizations, that top-down approach will be an imposed budget will be more important or will be more useful in order to define until stability occurs, until the organization starts getting stable, then maybe you will now want the junior managers to be participating in that. But at the beginning, it will be important for a strong um, decision-making process. It is very negotiated or very, then that might not go well for the organization. So we'll have to look at circumstances. And then the, the third type is the negotiated. In the negotiated, it's a mixture of the top-down and bottom-up. So were basically um, prepared by junior management and then sat down at upper level and then decisions are made and then sent back to junior management. That is a negotiated rather than negotiation approach. But the primary ones that are looked at are the top down and the bottom up. Right, so we'll go back to look at this. So um, we said, that the budget has, in a top-down approach, it has very little um, input by junior managers. The main advantage to this approach, like we said, is speed. So we'll come to um, discuss a few things that we're now articulating here. So the main advantage is speed. Um, budget implementation is quicker and can be particularly suitable where decisions are needed to be made quickly or for a relatively small organization. So we would have to um, particularly with objective questions, they might have some caveat to what they are discussing before the question is set. So let's not just always go and say bottom up or nothing more. Now, the main advantage or the main disadvantage to the approach of the top down approach is the fact that junior managers might not feel part of the budget and so will not take ownership. Now, the budget decision might also not take cognizance of specific issues of those. Um, departments or the operating environment in which the individuals operate. You're sitting down at head office and you're making a budget for different um, aspects of the organizations that might be in different operating environments that might be in different jurisdictions. Now, it will be impossible really for the senior managers in their own location to be able to understand everything that will be, all the small dynamics that will be occurring in those places. And so um, we'll generally see that there might be a need to incorporate information from those individuals that are involved with the execution of the budget. Remember that it is not the senior managers that are executing the budget. So if they are making the budget, then there are chances that they might not have all the necessary information. And so the, we come to the bottom-up approach now or the participatory approach. Is this fine? <coughs> yes, please. Sorry, excuse me. Approach or negotiated approach. Which one is more realistic? Which one has a more realistic budget that can be met? Um, negotiated has the issue of being very needs a lot of input back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So it can be very time consuming. The bottom up approach theoretically is saying that junior managers should just prepare the budget and then send it upstairs. If they send it upstairs, then the chances are that 
they would have embedded Slack. And if there's no proper monitoring of this, then that might not be a very good budget. So ultimately, bottom up, um, a negotiated budget might be the most ideal under normal circumstances. But that is under normal circumstances in the cases where there's time for that budget to. Um, so you see what happens in Nigeria. Nigeria will, will generally, at federal government level, will be seeing some kind of negotiated budget where um, it is made by the different um, MDAs those, and then sent to um, the National Assembly and National Assembly sent it to executive, executive sent it back to the National Assembly and then fine tuning is done before it is finally approved. Now that will be a negotiated kind of budget. But you see the problem too is that if care is not taken, we'll be in June and we're still trying to get the budget for the year. So that's the problem that it might take time and then political um, influences might come in. So all of this, because I then go back to the point we said we made earlier, which is that a budget is a human activity. So the politics of this world and the other aspects that might make something that theoretically sounds very good, actually not as practicable as it sounds, are uh, issues that should be incorporated. And this is one of the things that the examiner is particularly interested in, that we don't see budget like a holy book that came from heaven. A budget is something that there are inputs of different individuals and there are, there are, there'll be sentiments involved with budgeting and these sentiments have to be factored in. So under normal conditions, we'll say a negotiated approach, solid, but we have to understand what the conditions specific to our um, discussion are for us to be able to decide which one is the best. Is this clear? Yes, please. Yes, it is. All right, so we just come and put it. It seems like some people are trying to get into the class. Yeah, they are okay. getting. All right, I don't know. I think they've gotten in. Yes. All right. All right, so with the bottom up approach, the participatory um, budgeting, in this um, approach, Deborah, did I answer your question clearly? Yes, you did. Okay, all right. So in this approach, the budgeting process starts from the functional managers, so the junior managers who prepare their budget. And these budgets are now, um, now collated at the top and form the basis for the overall organizational budget. Now, the advantages of um, a participatory approach, like we said, is that the budget will factor in the particular issues faced by the junior managers. The other issue is that um, functional managers would feel, would likely feel part of the process and so will have incentives to perform. And our disadvantages, if we're looking at the disadvantages are that the implementation might be slower than necessary due to the need of contributions from the different parties or the different junior managers. And this might not be favorable, particularly in times when decisive action is needed. So like that's um, in a picture that we've said before. And maybe one of the most 
um, the most the biggest weaknesses of a participatory budget is that junior managers might not see the big picture, and so might have um, budgets that deviate from strategic direction. So the strategic direction of the organization, and like we just typed here, with the negotiated approach, it, um, it involves aspects of the other, the two other approaches. Above which, where um, the budget is prepared by junior managers and deliberated on after inputs by senior management before the budget is finally agreed on. The major disadvantage will be with respect to the time consumption of this budget. All right. Okay, so we look at the types of budgets now. Um, when we're looking at budgeting type, we can and distinguish between fixed budgets and flexible budgets. And this will form a core of our discussion over the next, maybe till the end of our discussion. So we'll constantly refer back to this knowledge of fixed versus flexible budgets. Now a fixed budget is a budget prepared at the beginning of the period. And this budget will not change with changes in level of activity. So we would have a fixed budget, a fixed budget will be fixed and it would have, it will be fixed like that. It will not change with levels of activity. On the other hand, flexible budgets are prepared, can also be prepared at the beginning of the um, period. So um, let me show you what I mean by this. Now we're going to look at two things now. So when you have a fixed budget, the fixed budget will be at 100% performance now. So maybe you have your units at say, you know, let's say um, 200 units. And then you have all your other information. So your selling price or revenue, your <clears throat> material cost, your labor cost, your overheads and so your variable overhead and then your fixed overhead. This will be at that 200 units. That is what we budgeted for at the beginning of the period. Now a flexible budget or flex budget will now be prepared. Maybe they can prepare a flex budget at 180 units. So if we have a 10% reduction in the number of units, how does this affect our budgeting? And we can flex the budget maybe 220 units if we have um, a 10% higher than the expected. So these are flex budgets. Flex budget would change with level of activity. So we're changing that level of activity. Now our actual figures might be something else. And then we want to look at um, how um, this work. Now I'll use this as the basis for um, discussing something for us to be able to see how, how we flex budgets when we have a fixed budget. So flexible budgets are prepared to incorporate different potential levels of activity. They could be prepared at the beginning of a period or prepared based on the actual performance. So based on the actual level of activity to facilitate comparison between um, expected performance or between the budget and the result. It will be baseless for you to um, compare between the actual and the fixed budget when two of them don't have the same basis, where they have different levels of activity. Why you flex a budget is for you to get a level of activity that mirrors the level of activity of the actual, uh, actual performance so that you can actually compare like with like. Does this make sense? Yes. All right. So we go on to, um, so let's let's look at the budget. Let's just, the basic budgeting principles are what we want to do here. Let me make sure that we're fine.
So we have our number of units. So let's start with our selling price. Oh, sorry, our revenue. Let's go all sales to find. So sale. So 200 units now. Sales of um, 2,500 dollars. And then our direct material cost of um, say 1,000. So very material intensive. And then our direct labor cost of say um, 500. So we're using simple figures. Our variable production overhead so that we're clear about this from the beginning. And let me increase this a little bit. So let me call this let me call this four five instead. Our variable production overhead of one thousand two hundred, and then our fixed production overhead of say one thousand. 500, what's our profit? So all the others apart from the first one are subtracted now apart from sales, we're subtracting one, two, three, I hope I've not exceeded this. I've exceeded it a bit. Seems so. One, two, three, four. Four. I've exceeded it. Four, two. Oh, 300. That 300. Obviously. Yes, 300. Okay. So I don't know that that reflects, but it's fine to do what I want it to do for me. Oh. So one, eight now. We have four, one. Direct material cost 800. So direct material cost 820. Direct labor cost. What's happening? Direct labor cost. So what's our profit here? Ten. Yeah. Three ten. Three ten. Mm. All right. So let's let's start with our first. As we're now introducing ourselves, that's why budgeting and variances are incorporated or are usually looked at the same. Now, in terms of our sales, uh, we say that when our budget budgeted is better than our actual, what does that mean? That's not a good thing, Abi. Yes, it's bet budgeted is better than actual, or higher mm -hmm. than actual. And because I don't want to use higher. Higher and lower will be dependent on whether it is sale or whether it is cost. Advanced variance. Can we use the word? Yeah, that's the correct word. Mm, adverse, right? So it will be adverse. So I'll come and this is this is work that we have to do over 
coming period. So we have uh, work cut out. And then when the budgeted is worse off than the actual. Um, we say that that is favorable, Abi. We would have used actual first, so actual better than um, this. And then we say that, so when our actual figures are better than our budget, then we say that's favorable. Now, if we are going to compare our budget with our, our budget here with our actual, now our sales, sales, is this favorable or adverse? We budgeted to sell, this is in dollars, all of these are in dollars. So budgeted to sell four five, we actually sold four one, good or bad? Bad, adverse. Bad. So we say this is adverse, Abby. Yes. So better still, we could actually do the adverse as, okay. So let's just look at it as that's adverse. On the other hand, Direct material, we budgeted 1,000. We actually um, spent 820, good or bad? Good. So favorable. Direct material, we budgeted 500. We actually spent 450. Good, favorable. 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 Variable production of our head, we budgeted one, two. We actually spent one, one, 20. And then the fixed overhead is neither here nor there. We budgeted to one five and we spent one four. So favorable, right? Mm. Okay. Now, what can we say about all of this? What can we say? What's our conclusion? Overall, it will be favorable because they are more favorable than that part. Okay, but although it depends on the it depends on the quantum of the adverse. It depends on the size of the adverse. Oh, okay. the adverse, yeah. It depends on the size of the adverse. But the most important thing we can say from this, and this is the part that I want you to remember for exam purposes and for discussion purposes, even professionally, the most important thing we can say here is that this our whatever analysis is rubbish. That's the most important thing we can say. It is rubbish, it's completely rubbish. You can compare 200 Budgets. units with, sorry, was it 2,000? Why is it 200? Okay, so this is supposed to be 180, 180 rather than um, rather than 180. Okay, so you can compare 200 units with 180 units. Normally, the sales would be higher at 200 than 180 and the cost, will generally be higher at 200 than 180. So our basis of comparison is rubbish. There's no, we have not done anything really. Mm -hmm. That's all you can say really. It's not overall favorable, overall adverse. Nothing, we've not done any work. No work done. That's all we can say. Now, the only way that we can make a comparison that makes sense is if we can flex the budget. If we can have our budget based on 180 units. And that's okay. what flexing is. If we can make our budget based on 180 units, then we can now say, yes, we can make a comparison between the actual and the 180 units, uh, sorry, and the flex, because both of them have the same basis for comparison. So how do we flex this now? We have sales, and sales are at, what's this, at 180. So we can get our selling price, Abby. So if we get them per unit, then we make our lives easy. So what's our selling price now? 2.5. So our selling price, um, our total sales divided by the number of units will give us the selling price of one unit. 22.8. 200. Why? 0.5. 200. Okay. Yes, 200. We're doing this divided. We'll use the budget as the basis. Yeah, 22.5. 22.5. Yes. 
So we have 22.5. So sorry. for for 180 units now will be 22.5 times 180. 4,015 naira. Yes, sir? 4,015 naira. 4,050, please. That last yes. thing you said. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Don't mind me, I'm a typical Nigerian. Don't mind me. Just only that last word I'm complaining. Every other thing I'm fine. Okay. Well, I don't think I don't think it can cost you any. In fact, me, I never write in any figure. But I don't do that. I'm used to dollar for ACC exams. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so now I don't write in, uh, okay, so I'll write in any figure. Okay, so our direct material cost. Direct material, we know direct material is what? One thousand. So direct material cost per unit now. Five. Will be one thousand over two hundred, which is five. Uh -huh. So five times the one eighty unit. Looks like nine hundred. Nine hundred. Yeah. Nine hundred. Okay. Then we'll go to the next one. Then our direct labor cost per unit is still direct labor, so we have the same thing. So five hundred. Um, five hundred over two hundred. That's two point five. Five. Times one eighty four fifty. Times one eighty. That's exactly four fifty. So half of nine hundred. Then variable production overhead. Variable. So same thing. Six times one to divided by two hundred. That's six, Abi. Yes. So six times 180. 1080. 1080. And then our fixed production overhead. Seven point five times one eighty. One three fifty. The fixed production overhead is one five. One three fifty. One five. Okay, fixed. Okay. Let's continue arguing about it so that everybody be clear about this. Mm -hmm. so the fixed production overhead is one five because the fixed production overhead doesn't change with level of activity, so it must okay. be exactly the same thing as what was in the budget. Is that clear to everybody? Yes. That's very important to remember. At this point now, we can now start comparing the actual with the budget. And we can compare this with some level of sense in it. So if we compare the actual with the budget now, for for our sales, our sales, Four one compared to four zero five zero. Favorable or adverse? Adverse. I I I, I saw favorable. Though. Adverse Remember, is lower. We actually sold. Favorable. I expected to sell four zero five zero. We actually sold four one. We're expecting to sell 4050. Okay, okay. That's, That's favorable, favorable right? then. Okay, yeah. then our cost 8, 820 compared to 900. We plan to. That's adverse. So we spent less favorably. We spent, we spent less. Seven. Okay, favorable again. It's favorable. Remember that sales variances will be the exact opposite of cost variances. 
So we incurred four, well, we incurred 450. We expected to incur 450. This is still 450, so nil there. Then we planned to spend 1120. We actually spent 11080. So that's favorable, right? Favorable. Oh, we spent more. We spent more than we expected, Abby. So that's adverse. So we spent more than we expected adverse. And then on fixed overhead, we spent less than we expected. So that's favorable. So our flex budget is basically using the, now be careful about one other thing. That's a mistake I made. I missed, I missed an opportunity to do something here. Which was important to me. Mr. Right, let's see whether we can scoop money. Yeah. For the fixed um, production overhead, mm -hmm. you wrote that the actual is to work for. Yes. You're going to use the what you budgeted. The budget is not going to change. That's what I'm saying. Since the budget cannot change, so can you actually use one four? Because if you if you actually spent one four, then mm -hmm. it's it's favorable. I don't know. I'm, what I'm saying is, is it not supposed to still be one five? The actual. that you actually spent less on fixed overhead than you budgeted now. But what you are saying is that when you're flexing the budget, the flex budget for your fixed will be fixed. It will be based on what the budget was. Okay, when it's flex, but for actual, you can actually spend less than your fixed yes. production. Of what you are yes. Saying. Yes. Uh, it's possible. I thought it's fixed, like no matter what, that's what you definitely spend. Yeah, but your landlord can reduce your rent now or can increase it. So it can change. Can never reduce your rent, can only increase it. Okay, I've heard you. All the same. <laughs> oh, God. We need. They will sure. always Okay, you can reduce it to something can touch you. It's not impossible. Okay. Okay, so I I missed I missed the trick here. Ah, uh, it's going to be messy to do it. Okay, so let's move on. Let's move on. It's fine. Well, let's 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 put it here. Then. Just assume that they told us. Now we have seen this. I want you to see it here too now. They didn't give us two. For the one that they would normally do now in this case they, we wrote direct labor cost let's be conscious of that now let's say supposing they give us labor cost and we have labor cost at two flex levels or at two levels so the fixed or so at 200 units and at 180 units. And our labor cost, so the cost was say 800, at 200 units and 720 at um, 180 units. How do we find what our cost will be at say 160 units? What do we do? 
uh, gradually introducing ourselves into stuff. What do we do? They're giving us labor cost at 180, sorry, at 200 units of 800, and labor cost at 180 units of 720. And we want to find out what will be our labor cost at 160 units. Is everybody here? Yes. So Chata, what do we do? Just let you handle some money. All the back. I didn't hear you. Can I talk? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I said we'll the 800 by 200 units, the 800 by 200, and give us four. Same with the 720 by 180, it also give us four. So that means it's four dollars. 720 divided by 184. Accidentally, yes. And that's what I didn't want. So let me change it. For seven fifty. I want to introduce something to you, but I don't want to get to that point before I introduce it so that you will be able to, I want your knowledge to be kind of fluid. They're giving us at 200 units, I have $800 spent on labor. At 180 units, I have 750 spent on labor. How do I find out what I would spend at 160 units? Chiwe. Well, I did that question already. Thing. How would you now put the 160 into your cross multiplication? Hello? You don't have any baby. I said, how yes, would you? question. In the other one, uh, he had it at 740 or so. I mean, he, he, he checked out. So I did 160 times 750 divided by 180. Wait. No, Brian. Brian, this is not a good case. Is that? Yeah, you know when we changed good... it, it's faulty. I mean, I don't know. We changed good... it, it's faulty. This is a good case of high-low method. Okay, so that's what I've been waiting for you now. Because the answer oh, is high-low method. And I like the fact that you're saying, oh, three. that means you even know what the high-low method is. The problem is you know it. The issue yeah. is when you saw it, the way they've set it, would you be able to understand that it was high-low method they were asking you for. But this would be a very good case for you to do the high-low method. Oh, for you yeah. to, because they've told you labor cost. If they've told you labor cost, it means that they're telling you that this is semi-variable. It is not just variable cost or just fixed cost. It is semi-variable. So when they don't say direct labor, labor costs are generally semi-variable. So be conscious of that. And I wanted you to say it in another way rather than coming to that part and discussing it. So how do we do the high-low method? First of all, we want to get our variable cost per unit, right? So if we add step up, we remove the step up. But if we're just doing the basic thing, so now our variable cost per unit will be what? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Okay. So our variable cost per unit will be equal to our cost, cost divided high. by unit. Cost divided by unit. Yeah, so the cost at high. Cost at high minus cost at low. Cost at low. All of that. Unit at high minus unit at low. So unit, high unit minus low unit. 0.5. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have high low. 
literal. So that's what 800 minus 750. Please, when this high low comes in the exam, make sure you saw it was high low. So 200 minus 180. So that's 2.5, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so our 2.5. Then the next thing we want to do is to get our fixed cost, our total fixed cost. And our fixed cost will be the total cost minus the variable cost per unit multiplied by the number of units or sales volume. So we can use at any of the levels. So we can use the high level now. So our total cost will be 800 minus our 2.5 we calculated multiplied by 200 units. That's our fixed cost rather. 300. Is that 300? This 500 now. Yes, it's 300. Okay, so 300. So the fixed portion of this is 300. So therefore our total cost at um, 160 units now. Our total cost at 160 units will be um, the fixed cost plus the variable cost per unit multiplied by number of units. So remember that this is total variable cost now. Um, this part is total variable cost. This part is total variable cost, and this is fixed cost. So basically, no, go back. So this will be equal to our fixed cost of 300 plus, remember when we looked at this total cost function fairly recently. So our variable cost of 2.5 multiplied by the 160 unit we want to get its cost at. So that gives us 700. Exactly 700. All these yes. figures very close to each other. So 700. And that's our total cost. So it has a 300 fixed portion to it and then 400 variable portion to it. So please let's remember this one that they either give us exemptions for what we did in our earlier ICCA studies. Be conscious about how to do this. Is this clear? Very clear. All right. So we go to, we now go to budgeting approaches, budgeting techniques rather. Let's look at our budgeting techniques, introduce them. Mm. So look at the different techniques that we have. All right, so we'll look at the budgeting techniques. We'll look at um, all of them, um, quite highly examinable in terms of the part C. So incremental budget, um, I wouldn't have liked to write this out and waste time. Then we'll look at um, zero base budget. And then we look at rolling budgets. Mm, which one has? So rolling budgets, and then we look at um, activity-based budgets. So activity-based ABB. Activity-based budgets are based on act the principles of activity-based costing. That's all you need to know. So you've done one of them already. And then we, after we looked at these 
four primary um, techniques, then we go beyond budgeting. All right, so incremental budgets are simple budgets. Basically, the um, primary way by which historically budgets are prepared. So with the um, incremental budget, what happens is that the current year's budget or next period's budget will be based on this period's budget incorporating um, some kind of incorporating some allowance for inflation and growth. So we'll use the current budget, current year's activities, and incorporate some um, form of um, increase for or decrease, of course. So if our if the budget is if the if we're expecting that we'll grow in the future, then um, in the next period, then there'll be some incorporation for growth and if possible inflation. So that's how the um, incremental budget is. So it's the current year's um, activities are incorporated for or are adjusted for expected inflation and growth. Now, the good thing, so if we, for example, the number, the way we normally do budgets, we'll see a number of budgets like this. Maybe we had our sales in this current period. So let's say we have sales of a thousand in the current year, then we'll be expecting that next year, maybe we'll incorporate a 5% for inflation and growth. So what we'll be expecting is that next year's um, budget will be 1050 at 5%. So that's essentially and so on and so forth for the different um, figures. So we're just incorporating um, some adjustment for inflation and growth. Is this clear? Yeah. Yes, it is. Now, traditionally, the uh, incremental budgets are the um, historical way that budgets are prepared. And we have some issues with respect to incremental budgets. They are, while they are, they are fast to prepare, they are fast, and they will be particularly suited for stable operating environment. They'll be particularly suitable for stable operating environment. But the issues with this are that there is a chance that if there are any mistakes or any issues with the current budget, then they will be incorporated into the future budget. So uh, mistakes can be continued, Abi. Mistake errors. So if you had ghost workers before, you've inflated them by a number of staff. They're just making the same mistakes. So mistakes can be continued. And inefficiencies can be embedded. So Slack, you can start in embedding Slack into your budget. So in the situation where you're saying, let's um, increase the cost because we're not expecting or because we don't want the budget to, to be too strict for us, then the chances are that this can continue because you're just inflating the budget and still using and um, based on the current activities. So that's an issue with that incremental budgeting in a nutshell. Now, zero base budgets, zero base budgets, like, as the name implies, we start with a zero base in a zero based budget. All right, we're carrying out a zero-based budget. A zero-based budget will require a, there are three steps to zero-based budgeting. Um, we'll talk about identifying decision packages or defining the decision packages. So define decision package or the decision packages, and then um, we rank these decision packages. Did I just say about decision package? Sorry. 
So we identify, our uh, first step is to identify or okay. define decision packages. Then the second step is to rank these decision packages. And the final step is to allocate resources. And I'll just explain this in a nutshell and we'll um, expand on this in our next discussion. So allocate. So allocate resources. All right. Now a decision package is an event or or an an a, an activity in the organization for which um, we are making a budget for. So an activity that will incur cost for which um, we need to allocate resources to. That is a decision package. So any activity within the organization for which cost will be incurred that will be a decision package. So with a zero-based budget, like I was saying earlier, a zero-based budget is a budget. Remember with incremental, we say we have the original or our current um, budget and we're incorporating, and we're using the current budget as the basis for preparing next year's budget. In a zero-based budget, we have a zero base. So we're using, we're not using anything. So anything that we've done before, is not incorporated into the budget that we are preparing. So we are starting afresh, essentially. So the first thing to do is, since we are starting afresh, we don't have any information in the past or any information of the current period or of any other period that we are using. We're just starting afresh. So the first thing is to identify what are the various activities that we want to um, budget for? What are the various activities that are going to incur costs? So we want to make a budget for them. So that's the defining the decision packages. So look at an example of, um, so what are we going to use now? Lazily use the hospital again. So what will be the, what will be examples of decision packages in the hospital? Where's everybody? You're muted. You're still muted. So examples of decision number of operations to be carried out. No decision packages will be number of patients. Uh, no, the patient will not. Okay, have to. The patients are your customers. This for things. Okay, this for cost, right? Yes, for the cost. For just for cost. To, to incur. Yeah, for the cost you're going to incur. Those are your decision packages. So we'll have things like, say. Stuff. Doctors, staff, um, nurses, nurses. What else? Cleaners for hospital. Also cleaners, and uh, support staff. So after nurses, the rest of them support, are support, support, all support. So let's just use um, support staff after the nurses. Yeah. So doctors, lawyers, even admin. What else? Um, so we'll have um, we'll have maybe supplies. Maybe we'll have ambulances. So the vehicles so ambulance. Um, medication is medication under supply. Yes, it is. It should be. Or well, you want to separate it since your hospital. Oh, so so medicine. Because you could have supplies of bed sheets and stuff bed sheet, in bedding. So all of these will be defined decision packages. The next thing we'll do with um, zero based budget, as we said, is that we'll rank the packages. So now we'll now start deciding which one is most important to us. So we'll start with this when we discuss. So we'll rank them. Maybe we'll start early. So we'll rank all of these. So maybe we have, um, now before we discuss zero based budgets further, would have to define these decision packages can either be incremental or mutually exclusive. So we'll talk about what this means. So we can either have incremental, in which case we are starting at, or so we either have incremental decision packages or mutually exclusive packages. Now I'll explain this with respect to, so if we can just um, remember the basic things we used for the hospital here. 
that will be useful to us. So doctor, nurses, support, supplies. We're not, we're not, we're not a medical school, so I'm not trying to get it perfectly. I just want us to get an understanding of how decision packages work. But once we've, once we've gotten, hypothetically now, let's assume that our incremental, for incremental packages, we have the base, the minimum number that we should, can have. So let's assume our three doctors is our minimum number. And then we can add one, one, one going forward after the three, but we must have at least three. Our nurses say six, and then we can have maybe two more added, two more added per new doctor. Then our support, we have maybe five staff at the base, and then we can have, for every new doctor, we have two new um, support staff. Um, supplies, we have maybe a hundred units of whatever the supply is, and then the incrementals will be 20, um, 20, 20. Uh, and then we have rent or buy. Now, our rent or buy is basically, we said we either have incremental packages or mutually exclusive, right? Now for the, for the, for the um, other packages, ambulance, so we can actually say we can either rent or buy an ambulance, and that will be mutually exclusive. So if we're renting, we're not buying. If we're buying, we're not renting, right? And then maybe we can have three ambulances, and we don't have any incremental to it, any other. So it's just three, and that's our base rate. But we can either rent or buy the ambulance. The same thing with the building. We can either rent or buy the building. And these two are mutually exclusive because if we're renting, we're not buying. And then medication can be incremental in the sense that maybe we have um, 50 here and then incrementals of 10, depending on the additional doctor, that kind of thing. Now, once we've done this, these are, we've identified our decision packages. The next thing we'll do is to rank the decision packages. So maybe our ranking with this now, our ranking, maybe this is first. This is second, and my support is third, supplies fourth, medication should have been first step. You don't need any, oh, but in Nigeria, medication. No, <clears throat> if there's no doctor, there's no medication. Yeah, but it depends on which, 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 okay, before, that doctors will come before medication. Yes, there has to be a doctor first, because medication, you can go to a pharmacy to go and buy. Because in Nigeria, medication will come last. Medication will be like 200. It should not even be inside. We've not even budget for medication. So we cannot buy their medication on their own. Okay, so fifth. And then maybe um, the next doctor, sixth. I don't know, maybe ambulance, sixth. Mustn't all be on the same line. Then maybe this is seventh. This is eighth. This is ninth. And then maybe the next one is tenth. And then uh, supply 11th, this is 12th, um, this is 13th. I'm just saying this is 14th. All of this will be based on defense and so on. Um, this is 15th. Once we've done all of this now, we've now um, ranked these decision packages up to the final one in all of that. Then the next step will be to allocate resources. So based on, let's assume we had say um, $300,000 for the period. Then we now start allocating resources to each of them until we've exhausted our the amount that we have. So we might have exhausted it at number 14, for example. And so we're not going to any other thing outside 14 will not be part of our budget would ignore it till the next period. In the next period, it will have to be defended. So for us to, first of all, um, define decision packages and rank these decision packages, the, a defense has to be made. We have to decide the criteria for acceptance. So, so they have to defend um, every single budget line for it to be able to be incorporated into the budget. So what is incorporated into this year's budget might not make next year's budget because maybe we already have We've already seen that four doctors will be able to do the work for us. We will not have any of these other two doctors in the subsequent period because it's not necessary and so on and so forth. Is this clear? 
All right, so that's the um, basics for um, the zero base budgeting. So we'll continue from here and discuss more thoroughly how the zero base budget is and all the other budgeting techniques. And please remember that this is quite important. This is very, very important. All right, so see you tomorrow. Okay, bye, bye. Bye, bye everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.